welcome back song of songs part 3 and we studied in part 2 what the bride started to say to the bridegroom verses 2 3 and 4 of the book of song of songs chapter 1 and now let me start with verse 5 the bride says not to the bridegroom, but to somebody else. This is the verse. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedah, as the curtains of Solomon. What does this mean? Very amazingly, this talks about the Gentiles and the Jews. You know, with the coming of Jesus, the gospel was extended to the Gentiles because of which people like me, Gentiles, have come into the family of God. Now, there may be uh, some Jewish people who are watching this. Now, so don't be offended for what I'm going to say. I work very closely with Israel. I work with uh, the Jews a lot, both Messianic and regular. And... Uh, not everybody, but a majority of the Jews have a very high opinion of themselves, which is wonderful. But they sometimes look very low upon the Gentiles. Now, I am a Bible scientist and I have to sometimes work with Jews uh, when we do excavations in examinations, archaeological discoveries, etc., and I have experienced this firsthand, where no matter how much people like me know, they always have that feeling of the, 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 the uppishness, not in a negative way all the time, but also in, in a positive way. But, but most of the time they, they feel like we are the people of the book, we are the people of God. Uh, you know, it's like uh, if you have watched The Fiddler on the Roof, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, God must bless us. I mean, it, I mean, after all, we are Jews and he has to honor us, you know, sort of mentality, which is not all that wrong. And if you look at the book of Romans, uh, the church in Rome had similar problems and that's why the apostle Paul had to deal with both the Jews and the Gentiles in making both accept each other. And here... The idea is, the prophetic idea is that the Gentile church, the Gentiles like me, we are talking to the Jews, daughters of Jerusalem. Who are they? Jews. So, O oh ye daughters of Jerusalem, I am, I am black. What is black? A negative color. Black is a inferior color. So, Yes, in your eyes, we are black. We, the Gentiles, do not deny the fact that we are inferior to the Jews when it comes to God, the Bible, and everything. Okay? But, look, look at this verse. I am black, but comely. Yes, we are inferior to you, O Jews, but... The Lord Jesus has brought us high up and made us beautiful. The blackness has not gone. We are still Gentiles, but we are made beautiful. We are now presentable. We are now eligible to be the bride of the Messiah. Interesting, eh? So I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedah. You know, I mean, it's like as blue as the sky, as green as the grass, you know, like that. Black as the tents of Kedah and the curtains of Solomon. But now we are comely, meaning we are beautiful. So those of you who are Gentile Christians, don't worry, we are made Beautiful. We are no longer inferior to the Jews. Okay? We respect the Jews. I mean, I'll, I'll come to that. It's there later on in these verses. It's there. 
we have to respect Israel, we have to bless Israel. Genesis 12, 3 is still valid, all that is true. But we, the Gentile Christians, are now brought up, made beautiful to be the bride of the Messiah. What is Ephesians 2, 2 about? It says, we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, you know, we were resurrected and we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Glory to God for that, okay? Now, let us look at verse 6. And the bride goes on to explain why she was black or why she is black. Look not upon me because I am black. Because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keepers of the vineyards. But mine own vineyard have I not kept. This is very poetical. Also symbolical. Also metaphorical. So we need to interpret this verse accordingly. And let me simplify it. It says that we who were Gentiles, we became black because we were exposed to the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Here the sun is not Jesus. Right now in, in the Bible sometimes Jesus is shown as the sun. Such as in Malachi chapter 4 where Jesus is the son of righteousness, okay? But, you know, here the sun and its UV rays are negative. They made me black. I'm, I was exposed to the sun. I was a guardian of the vineyard. I was not part of the vineyard, but I was the guardian, uh, the keeper of the vineyard. So, so I was exposed to the sun, which scorched me. This talks about our pre-Christian condition. Take me. For instance, before I became a Christian in 1979, I was a Hindu. And when I was a Hindu, I was exposed to the, the, the evil rays of the sun, evil sun. So I was black. I was dark. Black also is darkness, right? So I was dark. I was blind. I was black. I was bad. I was negative. Why? Because my mother's children, my people, didn't know the truth. They made me become what I was. Okay? And my own vineyard have I not kept. I, I couldn't take care of my spiritual condition. I needed an external help which I did not get until Jesus came into my life. Wow! Praise God! Now this is a message to Gentiles or even Jews who don't have Jesus. We need Jesus to come and light up our lights. Without Jesus, we don't have any light. And the absence of light is darkness, which is black. Okay? And that's what the bride says to the Jews. So in verse 5 it says, I'm black. Yeah, that's true. I'm a Gentile. But I'm made beautiful because of Jesus. Hey, Gentiles, glory to God, right? Praise God that we are in the family of God. The God of Israel is our God now. Wow. And then verse 6 says, all because in my pre-Christian life, I was a heathen, I was a Gentile, and I did not know, I didn't have Jesus to come and light my life up. Verse 7 now the bride is talking to the bridegroom again, okay? Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth. Jesus, I love you so much in my heart and soul. So I want you to tell me something, Lord. I see something very precarious, funny. I don't understand this. What is this? Where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, for why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? What is the meaning of this? We always see as a Gentile, as Gentiles, how God is looking after Israel. My dear friends, there are three opinions of Christians about Israel and the Jews. Two are very extreme and one takes the middle position. One extreme 
is so pro-Israel, it's too much Israel. You know, they, they, they say, now that we have, we have become spiritual Jews, spiritual Israel, we have to celebrate all the feasts and we have to wear the talit and we have to uh, follow the Shabbat laws and all that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, there are those who, who believe like that. Now, I am not against it if you are a Jew and if you are a Christian, you don't have to give your Jewishness up to be a Christian. You can remain a Jew and a Christian. Now, people like us who were Hindus, we couldn't do that. You know, Hindus cannot remain Hindus and be Christians. Buddhists or Muslims or others, they cannot remain as they are and be a Christian. But a Jew can remain a Jew and a Christian. That's how Paul was. That's how Peter was. Remember, Peter and John still went to the temple and they were Christians. And Paul went to the synagogues and just like the other disciples and they were Christians. So even today, if you are a Messianic Jew, you can be a Jew. You can celebrate all your feasts and you can do all your Jewish, whatever, your paraphernalia and be a Christian, a Messianic, you know. But people like me, you know, we can't do that. We, we never become biological Jews, can we? So that position, and you know, although I'm very pro-Israel and I'm very much uh, close to a lot of Messianic people, Messianic Jews, uh, I, I, I don't take that position, that extreme position. Then you get the other extreme where they despise the Jews, they despise the Old Testament, they despise anything Israeli and they say, well, God has done away with the Jews, done away with Israel. We have replaced, you know, we have replaced the Jews. So it's now the Christians through the past 2000 years, many Christians because of this mentality have had become anti-Semitics and they persecuted the Jews a lot and they massacred Jews in a large scale. Now that is too much. You know, now even, even now a lot of Christians take that position even though they don't go to the extreme of massacring. They're like, oh, we don't want to go to Israel. We don't want anything Jewish. We don't want... That is wrong too. Now the position that I have taken is some, somewhere in the middle and I believe that is the biblical position. That's the position Paul is recommending the Christians to do as per Romans chapter 11. Okay? I have a very high regard for the Jews. I bless them. I bless that nation. I pray for them, I give offerings to them, I go there all the time um, and uh, I even have three churches so far in Israel, one in Jerusalem, one in Tel Aviv and one in Haifa and um, I have plans to start more churches uh, in Israel in other cities. So I love Israel, Oh, th that's wonderful. But I don't behave like a Jew because I'm not. I'm a Gentile. Okay? And... Um, so, so that's the position I take. So here in verse 7, the church is asking Jesus this question. Lord, where do you feed your, your flock? Why? Because from the day you chose Abraham to now, we see that you have been protecting your people in a very special way. How many people tried to destroy Israel? How many people, you know, Babylonians tried, Assyrians tried, Egyptians tried, Romans, Greeks, and I mean, Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, even now a lot of people, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, and you know, Iran. So many people are trying to destroy Israel, but, but then look, look, look how God is protecting them. Huh? Right now, in this 21st century, we have about 6 million Jews living in Israel alone. Hitler assassinated a similar amount of Jews during the Holocaust. 6 million Jews. But look at Israel today. Praise God for God's protection, His providence, His amazing dealings with the Jews. So the church is asking, look, 1,000 years before the church came into existence, Solomon is prophetically predicting the question of the church, Lord, how are you feeding your flock? Because can I also come and enjoy that? You know, uh, um, by the flocks of thy companions. Wow. And where, where, where do you make your flock rest at noon? 
Because look, look at me, I was black, you know, exposed to the sun, but then they are not. They are being blessed, they are not destroyed. Now, the next segment is, the bridegroom is starting to respond. From verse 8 to 12. Okay, the bridegroom is starting to respond. And the first thing that the bridegroom is telling the bride is, if thou know not, if you don't know that, O thou fairest among women, wow, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. Okay, now here Jesus is praising the church, the Gentile church mainly, the church under grace. For the past 2000 years we are under grace, not under law. Okay, so if thou know not, if you don't know that, well, you know not a lot of things. Go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock, okay? And feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. Now, what is, what is the symbolic meaning to this? If you, if you read it peripherally, you will not understand. But there are two things that are mentioned here, tents and shepherds. And when I delve deep into analyzing this, I discovered two interesting things. The church and the pastor. Wow. The tent here is none other than the church. Okay? And the shepherd here is pastor. Of course, the word pastor means shepherd, right? You know, I am a Bible teacher. I'm a senior pastor. But still I am sheep, aren't I? Every Christian is one. And we need shepherds to lead us. We need leaderships. Now, you know, in, in our setup, I may be the senior pastor, but I have brought myself under the covering of the leaders of the, of the denomination. Why? Because I'm a sheep. I may have, you may have, many people may have gifts, anointing, abilities, responsibilities. There are evangelists that I know who are blessed with a lot of Gifts, and we know that there are apostles and prophets, a lot of prophetic knowledge, and, and then there are those who perform miracles, signs, wonders, and whatnot. The, the problem, one of the main problems we are facing today in the Christian world is heresy. Why? Because a lot of gifted, anointed people you know, are swaying out of the real path because they don't have a shepherd to control and curtail their movements. I mean, I shouldn't use the word control in, a, in that sense. You know, a shepherd is not a controller, he's a leader. He's a leader, he's a guide, he's a provider, he's a feeder, uh, he's a protector. I mean, you don't control, you know, it's not hard shepherding I'm talking about. But I'm talking about Proper biblical shepherding which each one of us need. We need. We need to submit to a church, to ourselves to a church. Now there are those who say, well, you know, there is not a good church around for me to be in a church. Many people run from one church to another. Why? Because they never find uh, uh, the best church for themselves. Hey, let me tell you, you will never find. You will never find. I mean, be it America, Europe, Sri Lanka, anywhere in the world, you will never find the perfect church. And if you found one, let me know, I'll resign and come and join that. Because for 2,000 years, nobody had a perfect church. You know, what about Pastor Jesus, the best pastor who had a little church of 12? What about the treasure? He, he, he was all the time money-minded guy, Judas Iscariot. You know, if somebody comes with a very expensive perfume, you know, he's talking about so social gospel, you know, sell that oil and give to the poor. And Jesus had to tell him off. And what about the senior of those 12, Mr. Peter? Jesus had to tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. Hey, pastors, try doing that with your assistant pastor. You'll be sued, you'll be taken to courts. Okay, so pastor Jesus had to say that to, to one of his senior uh, believers because because of their belief you know what about Thomas you know he wanted to uh, poke his finger before he believed 
You know, Jesus was the perfect pastor. He had a church full of imperfect people. So can you find a perfect church anywhere in the world? No, but still you need to get into one. You need to submit to one, a Bible abiding church, okay? And you need a pastor. You need a shepherd who can teach you, lead you, guide you. Because all of us are at the end of the day, sheep. So we, sh we shouldn't be like sheep without a shepherd. Of course, we have Jesus, the good shepherd, but we also are blessed with other shepherds. Okay, now, now the spiritual father is your own shepherd, like, right? Now many people who watch my programs in other languages also, you know, they think that I am, they, they want me to be their spiritual father. Well, it doesn't work that way. I'm the spiritual father only to the people of my church. To all the others, I'm the spiritual uncle. You need spiritual, a spiritual father. You cannot have multiple spiritual fathers. Your spiritual father should be your pastor of your church. So if you don't have any of those, come on, start today. Go and get yourself into a Bible abiding church and submit your, start submitting yourself to a Bible abiding shepherd or pastor. He may be less qualified than you, younger than you, not as rich as you. Okay? It doesn't matter. We all need a shepherd. And that's what the Lord Jesus is saying to his church in the opening verse of his discourse in the Song of Songs. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, you are fairest among women. That's a that's wonderful. You're a beautiful lady. You're wonderful. But still you need a shepherd. Okay, look. The bride is talking to the bridegroom. And the bridegroom is talking to the bride. But still the bridegroom is saying, you need somebody to teach you, to tell you, to let you, and to lead you, and to guide you. So my dear brother, sister, you may be somebody who hears from the Lord. And, you know, you may, you may think, well, I'm hearing from God. Why do I need a shepherd? You know, I talk to God and I, I, when I read the word, the Bible comes alive. All the logos comes as rhema to me and, and all that stuff. You know, I'm gifted. I'm a prophet. I'm a prophetess. Doesn't matter. We all need a church. We all need a shepherd. We all need to be led and to be guided because we are sheep. That's what the Lord says here. So my dear friends, today we spoke about the Gentiles versus the Jews. The Gentile church saying to the Jews, yes, I am black, but I'm beautiful. I'm a Gentile, I'm not a Jew. But I am a spiritual Israelite. I am a spiritual child of God. Okay? Why was I black? Because of my hedonism, because of my my gentileness, you know, I was a heathen, I was a gentile, I was a spiritual harlot, so naturally I was bad. But look at me now, a virgin, Jesus changed me. Wow, praise God. And then the bride asks the bridegroom, well, what is the secret behind you protecting and blessing your own flock, Israel? And Jesus says, mm, yeah, that's a secret. But then you get yourself into a, a church, get yourself a shepherd who will gradually, progressively teach you into all these truths and you'll be blessed. Wonderful, eh? So my dear friends, I will meet you in the fourth segment to continue from verse 9. Until then, be blessed. Glory to God.